Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of Business Beyond Borders, where we have made it our mission to talk to global experts and professionals, entrepreneurs, CEOs, and founders from a variety of industries and fields, as we tackle the many aspects of scaling an international business. The goal here is to collect valuable insights and share in-depth knowledge so that you too can apply the winning techniques and strategies to go global and take your business to the world. Hi there, I'm Cynthia Deeran and welcome to Business Beyond Borders where I unlock the secrets of international business success. Today I'm chatting to my colleague Ram Golamandala. Ram's an investment banker with 17 years of experience in banking and capital markets. He founded TAT Capital in 2013 with a vision to help companies in Australia and the Indian subcontinent to engage in cross-border trade and investment and to power growth with purpose. Ram, welcome to the show. Thank you, Cynthia. Thanks for having me. Now, 2020 has been a pretty weird year for most of us. What are some of the trends that you've seen this year in your line of work? Cynthia, I think 2020, to say the least, it has been a challenging year for every aspect of industry, whether it is banking and financial services or even healthcare or what the matter. I don't think there's any one industry which has been spared. Definitely one of the major trends that I have observed is people actually don't want to meet any more physically, which has been a great challenge. In an industry where we thrive upon client engagement, where deal making doesn't really happen unless until you see clients face to face, there are a whole heap of due diligence site visits, which are primary, which are important for a particular transaction to go through in my industry. All of them have been virtual in this year for a change. Lucky me, in my case, from my business point of view, we have been in a virtual environment for a good number of years, even before COVID. More than 50% of my office office strength is actually in India, and uh, they all dial in into a virtual environment pretty much on a daily basis for various, various pieces of work. So as far as working in a virtual environment, it hasn't been a great deal of a shift in terms of how we work. But as far as client engagement is concerned, it definitely has been a shift. Yeah, the Sydney CBD where I used to work out of, not anymore, doesn't feel like a workplace anymore. For a good part of the year, it's been a ghost town. I don't know what it's looking like at the moment. Yeah, so to say the least, it's been pretty disappointing from an engagement point of view, but from a business point of view, it has been business as usual. Mm. Have you seen the trend that I have been reading about in the press recently? I, I was looking at an Economist article a few days ago, which said that surprisingly, this was a year, at least in the States and in Europe, where a lot of capital had been raised because uh, bankers didn't really know where else to park their money. And so companies that previously would have struggled to get funding were actually having an easier time than they had in the past. Uh, yes and no. There are a certain industries which have definitely been beneficial of actually having access to deep pools of capital in the current market. And there are certain businesses which were definitely struggling. For example, any businesses which are technology ready, they were found enough, uh, they had enough access to good deep pools of capital. And any companies which are not technology ready, mainly in an offline environment with no real innovation into the business, they definitely struggle through the process. And also there are only those businesses who have engaged with the investment banks or the private equity venture capital goods well in advance to COVID are those the guys who are actually benefiting of raising pools of capital in COVID period. Mm -hmm. It's not like a company or a startup or a grown-up suddenly decided, okay, I'm now affected by COVID. Let me start engaging with a banker or an investor in the peak of the pandemic, and they were successful in raising capital. It is generally those groups of people who actually engages with these group of people on an ongoing basis are the ones who are the benefactors of, uh, of, of able to access the two fields of capital. Definitely any company which has been operating in an online environment, let it be the likes of, let it be in, in the global world, let it be the likes of Zoom, which has significantly benefited, or more recently the Airbnb IPO, which has been a hugely successful story. If I come, in, come back to an Australian environment, some of the greatest success stories in the recent past is definitely we have to talk about Afterpay, which has done exceptionally well. And even companies like Webjet, whilst the travel sector hasn't really been performing well, 
institutional investors and high net worths have actually rewarded them well by allowing them to raise significant pools of capital in the peak of COVID. So there are definitely companies which are online ready, which have capabilities offering a solution through digital channels have were able to successfully raise deep pools of capital. Mm. I want to back up just for a moment. There are lots of really interesting things for us to talk about, but I'd love to give people some context because from your name and listening to you talk, most of our listeners can probably guess that you have not always worked in the CBD. So I would love to know, and I don't think we've ever chatted about this before, how did you wind up in Sydney, Australia, doing the work that you do? Can you just tell us the story of how you arrived here? Sure. So I came in July 2004 to Australia as an international student. I have a master's degree in international business and a master of arts in international communication from Macquarie University. I'm a management accountant by my undergraduation from India. Yeah, so had a typical struggles of any international student goes through. I don't think any international student will have it easy to settle into a new country. And yes, yeah, so over the period of time, one thing that was definitely quite clear to me was I wanted a career in financial services while I was doing my degree at Pakora University. And I wanted to find a space for myself in the capital markets. And that that something was very clear. Like, But having said that, and uh, as you picked it up early, it's not easy for an international student to get there. I definitely did a few odd jobs here and there as a student, did a lot of uh, stacking up the shelves in Big W in early days in my career, did some, did some door knocking or selling what was called as three mobile back then. Now it's part of the order phone. I did some door knocking in the peak winter periods of 2004 learned how to sell in middle of winter in Australia. That was a bit of a, <laughs> a shocker to my personality. Yeah, so I had it definitely a rough start. But over a period of time, I found myself lucky to have been part of an organization called The Trust Company, mm-hmm. which is now part of Perpetual. And that was my first stepping stone into the world of financial services. And from there on, I had a wonderful career and been part of many boutique stockbroking firms and some of the larger brands like Accenture, Commonwealth Bank and Australian Stock Exchange to the name to name a few where I had an opportunity to interact with ASX listed CEOs and ASX listed boards, worked with over 75 different listed companies on the ASX, helped them with both primary market initiatives in terms of initial public offers, helped them with their M&A strategies across various industry sectors and also worked with all kinds of secondary capital market offerings. Let it be the rights issues, let it be the share purchase plans, let it be the consolidations. So yeah, by the time I was 29, 30 year old, I was quite lucky within the first 10 years of my life in Australia as an international student and early financial services employee for various of these employers. I was quite fortunate to have been given wonderful responsibilities to lead a transaction and work with the experience boards of various companies across the ASX, that definitely gave me an opportunity to think back on what is the next 10 years that I should be doing. And yeah, that's where I think I started figuring out this is the time I should probably think about setting up my own enterprise. And that's how Tath Capital was born in late 2013, early 2014. And yeah, so for the past seven and a half years, I now live and breathe Tath Capital and trying to make a difference for mid-market growing companies to find their feet across the border, mainly in the regions that I operate, and help these mid-market growing companies to find long-term patient capital alongside financial capital, which they need to scale up their businesses and grow their businesses, not only using a typical financial capital in terms of money from a, a venture capital or a private equity investor, but also find them strategic money from the industry groups or family office groups, which tends to be a little more patient capital as it doesn't really have a maturity date like a typical VC would have. So yeah, it's it's a mix of uh, these kind of pools of capital, which is what I bring to the table. And and that is definitely a unique selling proposition I brought to, I built into my business model. And why, what was the thing that made you decide to launch out on your own? Because it's not exactly a risk-free proposition and you were coming to this 
idea of creating your own business as somebody from outside, you know, not as somebody who'd been in Australia forever and had all the deep networks, but as somebody who'd come along pretty recently, you know, you could have stayed in the corporate world and had a very safe and kind of secure career and you decided to do something quite risky. What was the prompt? Oh, sure, Cynthia. I grew up in a family where I've watched a lot of my cousins and my extended family doing all kinds of business as I was growing up. But unfortunately, my father was not a businessman. He was a school principal. But one thing that always told me was that at some point of time, I will end up being a business owner. So (laughs) wanting to do business was definitely there in my blood, says you can sort of spay. But as far as investment banking is concerned in a country like Australia, where I don't really have a base, that was definitely the risk that I've taken. But having said that, I have, after observing the industry for 10 to 11 years as an employee working for various employers, I felt that I created a bit of a niche for myself, which is, which is to my advantage of looking at the mid-market sector across Australia, New Zealand, and India, where I not only bring a typical advisory capabilities, but also bring a lot of cultural capabilities to the mix and uh, a lot of uh, people and trust capabilities, which is always a, a bigger challenge when it comes to dealing with uh, international businesses and when it comes to dealing with cross-border trade and investment ideas. Mm. So I created a bit of a unique selling propositions into my business model and focusing on the markets that I've, I have uh, learned fairly well, either as a grown-up in one country and as a an employee and a student, an international student in another country. Mm. So I played to my strengths, I guess. And yeah, over the last seven years, I helped many companies to do wonderful things. And I could not have been very a lot more prouder than what I am today. Oh, that is, and that's a very cool story. Now, one of your key areas of focus and one of the things that you specialize in uh, and that you're doing a bunch of work on at the moment is promoting the Australian Stock Exchange, the ASX, as an alternative listing destination for companies from India. Why are you doing that? And what what's the opportunity that you see here? Cynthia, so as you would have seen through various forms of press, India as a country has significantly been benefiting from an influx of global institutional capital through venture capital and private equity in the last one and a half, two decades. Something that has been missing in Australia, Australia is not a country which is traditionally done well in the venture capital sector. Maybe in the last, say, seven to 10 years, we have been blessed with a few successful venture capital investors now coming across. But India as a country has attracted really good global names. Let it be the Axis, let it be the Sequoias, let it be the SoftBank, let it be the Salesforce Ventures, and so and so on. Most of these uh, large venture capital groups, while they come and invested millions and billions of dollars in India, these guys have also have, like I said before, they also have a maturity period for their term sheets. They all need to exit their portfolio companies at some time or other. So, But one thing they have definitely done to these Indian companies is they have taught these Indian companies a significant amount of corporate governance. They have taught these Indian companies to definitely think beyond borders, whilst India itself is a huge market. Most successful Indian startups today are now operating at a global scale, and they are, most of them are billion-dollar companies. And these companies were not existing even two decades ago. And Ola would be a good example of that, right? Absolutely. Or So, yeah, so when we talk about the FANGs in the US or the WAX in Australia, WAX as in Ystec, Afterpay, Xero, and uh, and so on, and the equivalents to that in India, we call them four posts. Four post F stands for Flipkart, O stands for All Your Rooms, P stands for Paytm, and O stands for All Our Cabs. Mm-hmm. All these four startups have definitely redefined the dream of an Indian entrepreneur when it comes to accessing global pools of capital to prove their product either locally or globally. Every one of these companies have global institutional grade capital on their register today. And every one of them are candidate worthy enough to be listed on an exchange like Australian Stock Exchange. And you asked why ASX? Let me put a few things into perspective here. Australian Stock Exchange is probably one of the most friendliest stock exchanges in the world when it comes to embracing early stage companies. 
when you mean early stage in the world of listed markets a company with a market capitalization anywhere between 100 to 200 million dollars so most listed companies and most of the bigger stock exchanges like to the likes of nasdaq or to the likes of hong kong exchange to the likes of singapore exchange they don't tend to really list the companies as early as a 200 million dollar market capitalization mainly when it comes to sectors select like technology and tech enabled ideas so this is where i think asx is quite different asx listing rules and asx framework allows for li- companies to seek early stage listing as they're building a world class company and there are amazing examples of how some of these companies have ended up performing so very well in spite of listing very early in their life cycle so that is something that i definitely think most indian companies are not aware of today mm-hmm. uh, typically which is why most indian tech companies or indian startups tend to go through say 5 6 7 in some cases even 10 rounds of private venture capital rounds of investment and by the time you ra- you raise five times of uh, private money invariably the founders are left with hardly any equity in the company when they are actually looking for a trade sale or an exit and this is where i believe some of these growing companies out of the indian ecosystem if they are looking for a, an earlier listing but still build a multi billion dollar franchise for themselves and the shareholders australian the uh, australian stock exchange is definitely a wonderful alternative to a series b venture capital round of investment mm-hmm. and uh, yeah so that's one of the primary drivers and another major driver i strongly believe is uh, again you may be aware of this cynthia at the moment asx moves around 2 trillion dollars of money on a daily basis on its capital markets uh, platform in terms of ex, uh, in terms of facilitating global trade on its ecosystem so there is australian super innovation pool of money is approximately worth about 2 trillion today and it is tipped to be a 10 trillion dollar pool of capital by 2038 which is about 80 years from today the super innovation money of australia uh, which has a population of approximately 25 million people is expected to be a 10 trillion dollar economy just by the local uh, local population size which basically tells me one thing there is approximately 8 trillion dollars of new amount new wealth going to be available in this country and this this 8 trillion dollars of wealth has to be very cleverly allocated across the world into high growth companies to ensure the retirement money for this australian community is being well looked after and when you talk about high growth companies i don't think anybody in the world can really look beyond countries like india and china and china had a wonderful run in the last two decades and i strongly believe that india is exactly where china was two, two decades ago and this is where i urge many indian companies to access this deep pools of capital available in australia today and also that will be available over the next two decades for them to build world class companies not only to serve the indian consumer but also to set out their global acquisition strategy Mm. Now obviously there is a bunch of opportunity here in Australia for Indian companies but what about going in the other direction what what are your thoughts on Australian companies going to India because obviously it is a huge market and as you've mentioned there's potential for it to be a replacement market for China but it also has a reputation in Australia for being quite difficult for foreign companies to go into what's your view on that look obviously india as a country with a billion people in population with 29 states it's in many cases it's a mini europe in the way it operates every state is different there are up, i believe there are about 18 official languages spoken apart from english so it is definitely a complex economy again that is where the opportunity lies and what i've been telling to my australian counterparts and australian colleagues is if you do want to take an india opportunity seriously identify a smaller subset within the bigger bigger market don't just go by saying uh, entire billion people is my market that's just not possible obviously and having said that uh, having an australian product wanting to get there you really want to figure out how you position yourself do you want to be a brand which is uh, riding the value wave 
or the quantity wave. You're looking either looking at a quality wave or a quantity wave. If you go by the quantity, then you're competing uh, at the economies of scale, trying to get your product into as many people as you can, as opposed to trying to get, if you're taking the quality way of trying to get your product into the people who are actually ready to pay the premium given you're an Australian product. But uh, for me, answer is a combination of both in many cases. In some cases, either one of these are possible. That's where I think there's definite advantages of uh, figuring out a proper market segmentation strategy. Dare I say, they should probably be engaging for uh, groups like yourselves to get, uh, seek proper advice on how do you how do they position themselves when they're crossing the border as an international business expert. And on back of such advice, they need to uh, forge proper partnerships. And obviously, like I said, India is a huge economy. You need to identify your local partners well in advance and uh, do a lot of field trips. Again, unfortunately, in the current COVID environment, that may or may not be possible. But I do strongly encourage you to do a lot of field trips, get to know your local partners well enough and do your research very well in terms of uh, scoping the market before you get there. Yeah, so, but with these kind of simple steps, one of the beautiful things about India is once you are there, make sure you are there for long haul. And if you're there for long haul, be rest assured you will be successful. Absolutely. Just, just the sheer size of the country gives you an opportunity to be successful. It's not a country where there is an, an analogo environment, which is generally quite quite popular in Australia. Are there you things go. that you think Australian companies should avoid doing? We've just talked about some of the things that they should do, and, and, and I completely agree with what you've said because we do see people taking very ad hoc approaches to market entry, not just in India but all around the world. You know, people come up with six markets they could go to and then sort of throw a dart at a wall and whichever one it hits, that's where they decide to go. So I, I completely concur with what you've said about profit market research and market scoping. Other things though that people should avoid doing, and I'm thinking specifically here of cultural mistakes and cultural missteps that people make. Are there any of those that spring to mind that you can highlight, you know, simple things that people should avoid doing which might get their business relationship in India off to a very bad start? Look, I think there are obviously there are a number of things that you should do. Obviously, like every country has a unique culture of its own whether it is the general approach in, in terms of people, but from a business perspective as well. In my experience, most Indians don't tend to say no that easily. We, are, we come from a culture, we tend to say yes for everything. And when it comes to delivery, it does take its own uh, sweet time to honor those deliveries given we, we, are a, we are a country where we generally struggle to say no. And that is probably because of the hierarchical environment that Indians have grown up where there's a lot of respect in the counterparts. And so so you do need to make sure every yes is backed up with a lot of uh, clear milestones so that you don't actually go by your counterparts' uh, verbal agreement with you. Make sure you have a strongly worded document to make sure that both sides of the parties are delivering on the milestone that they are delivering on. And second thing I might say is mainly around uh, planning. Make sure you take small steps at a time. Don't go all out. Do some pilot projects and get to know your partner. Don't go into the world of exclusivities. If any Indian partner ever says, I can get you to every part of India, unless until they are a large group like a Tata or a Reliance group or a Birla group, don't take their word for it. Make sure you fragment the market into different zones, whether it's the north sector, the east sector, or the southern sector, and go one, go understand your partner on their local strengths. And as you get comfortable with them, maybe you will be able to give the same partner access to one more region as they prove up one region. But at the start, I don't advise give anybody a pan-India exclusivity to anything that you do, whether it is a whether it is uh, selling a software that you built locally or a product that you're trying to launch into a country like India. I think that is some great advice. So my final question for you today is looking ahead, uh, putting 2020 behind us and looking to 2021, what, what are your thoughts and your suggestions for companies from Australia, from India, from, from anywhere really, who are looking to go global in 2021? 
Look, I think there are a couple of things that I've learned, not just in 2020, but over a period of working in the market. Most important thing that that's going to define how companies grow and scale going forward is definitely how well they look after their people and what is the culture or that the, they're, they're creating for the within the company and what is the culture that they are proud to represent both internally and externally. So people and culture for me is definitely an important driver. And beyond people and culture, I definitely would say systems in place. Figure out what systems you need to really scale. Most people are very busy, mainly from an entrepreneur's mindset or a CEO's mindset. We are all very busy trying to grow up your sales funnel as big as possible. But how often have you looked backwards and figured out how robust is your back office system? How robust is your people to actually handle grow, handle growth? So I would say beyond people and culture, it's definitely system, systems in place. And third, in the current environment post COVID, I definitely think there will be a lot of focus on what is now being called as impact, or in the world of fund managers, they call it as an ESG. Look at what is the kind of uh, impact that you're creating on environment. What impact are you creating on your social ecosystem, both across your shareholders and also your stakeholders? And how robust is your governance as you're starting to build a scalable company? So don't be afraid to build a culture of a board, a proper official board for yourself well and truly early as a private company try and establish good governance practices and a proper board to be answerable to even while you're a private company. I think these are some very good benchmarks you would want to put into place before you start thinking across the border. Let it be international border or a state border. Doesn't matter. The moment you think of scale, everything that I said is applicable. And I strongly believe that the institutional investor community globally is looking for these kind of drivers also when they're considering an appropriate an investment into a company. Most investors only invest in companies which has people with great vision at the top and uh, entrepreneurs who ensure the employees carry out the vision of the entrepreneurs in terms of a great culture that they set out for themselves and good systems and always do the right thing. You know, it's easier to take shortcuts in life and uh, doing the right thing is always comes at a cost with time and money. But if you do the right thing, be rest assured, there is enough pools of capital available across the world to help you grow sensibly in a secure way. That's great advice to finish up on. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you. Hi, everyone. This is Maher again. And just a few things before you head off. Firstly, if you feel you have gained valuable insights from the show, make sure to subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss another episode. More importantly, don't forget to tell your fellow entrepreneur and business leader friends that this is the best podcast to tune into if they're looking to take on the world with their products and services. Also, if you are loving the podcast, please take the time to rate and review as it's one of the best ways for us to get loads of free value into the hands of other entrepreneurs. And lastly, make sure to visit DearInAssociates.com that's D-E-A-R-I-N associates.com, where we have plenty of free resources and tools for you to get clarity and build momentum with your international venture. If you go there, you'll find the blueprint to international success, eBooks, our latest blog posts and more. So be sure to check it out. And until next time, this is me encouraging you to expand your vision and wishing you all the best as you continue your global journey.